Good evening. You know, fate can sometimes be very annoying. In these Sky at Night programs of ours, we do our best to be topical, and generally we get in anything that happens within a couple of hours of transmission. Well, last month, I went down to New Zealand to attend a Astronomical Congress there. I was away for a bit, and for the first time in years, I pre-recorded a program. And, of course, that was just the moment for the first naked eye comet we've had for some time. IRS Araki Alcock, one of the co-discoverers being our old friend George Alcock. And it tracked across the northern sky, passed between the bears, and then, rather quickly, went down into the southern hemisphere and was lost. But it was visible with the naked eye for two or three nights. It was photographed from the Greenwich Observatory. You can see there a bit of a tail. And um, a rather nice picture taken by Ron Arbor. And once again, you can see a tail there. In point of fact, it wasn't a big comet. It was a very small one, and that's why it moved so quickly. It was close to the Earth and came within about three million miles of us, which for a comet is very close indeed. But um, I'm very sorry, I couldn't tell you about it at the time. We do, in fact, have another comet now. This is a purely Japanese discovery, a Sugiano Sugegi, a Fujikawa. And that, at the moment, is near the square of Pegasus. And during June, it's going to track down past Pegasus, It'll go down into Aquila, not far from Altair, and then down in the general direction of the Scorpion. And at one stage, we thought it was going to be visible with the naked eye. But I'm afraid it looks rather fainter than we expected, and um, I don't think it is going to reach naked eye visibility. But uh, you may get it with binoculars. Anyway, I'm afraid it's not going to be spectacular. And uh, just in passing, uh, we have another Venus probe. On June the 2nd, the Russians launched Venera 15, which will reach Venus sometime in October. They haven't definitely told us what it's going to do, but I think it's very likely it's going to be another lander to parachute down through the atmosphere and get some more pictures back from the surface of that decidedly unfriendly planet. And, of course, Venus is now very brilliant in the western sky after sunset. You can't possibly miss it. Also, when the Russians send up one Venus probe, they frequently send up two, and so we may have another in the near future. We've got to wait and see. But now, on to our main topic for this evening. I think most people can recognize Orion, even though it's now slipping down into the evening twilight. And there's a picture I took of it some time ago, and you can see I was using an unguided camera, because owing to the Earth's rotation, the stars are drawn out into short trails. And there are two particularly interesting stars there. Uh, to the lower right, there is the bright white star Rigel, about 60,000 sun power. And to the top left, there is the red giant Betelgeuse, or Alpha Orionis. Now, Betelgeuse really is large. Its diameter is something over 250 million miles, and that's big enough to include the entire orbit of the Earth around the Sun. And yet, in the ordinary way, it looks like nothing more than a speck of light. But, using very modern techniques, we can actually record details on its surface. And here is a representation of Betelgeuse showing bright and dark patches, even though in ordinary pictures it appears merely as a dot of light. Now, this technique is known as speckled interferometry. It's something quite new. And this technique is now being developed in various places, for example, at the Royal Greenwich Observatory at Hurstmanshire Castle in Sussex. And so, who better to tell us about it than the director of the Royal Greenwich Observatory, Professor Alec Boxenberg. Alec, welcome back to the sky at night. What exactly is speckle interferometry? Well, that's rather difficult to describe, and it'll take me a little time. But first, let me begin by uh, looking at a picture of a star as we normally take it, that is, photographically, over a relatively long exposure. And this appears quite smooth, rather big. Uh, in this case, there are spikes that's just caused by the telescope. It might be better to see a drawing of a star. This is idealized, but still you can see it's very smooth. It's got a profile at the bottom there, which is peaked. And this is the sort of thing you see with a relatively long exposure in a big telescope, which has got a rather long focal length, so that the whole image is relatively spread out. Of course, the size is still small. In fact, under the best observing conditions, something like an arc second. An arc second is the size a 2p coin would appear to have at a distance of about three miles. Oh, that's but if we were to take a very short exposure picture, say, a fiftieth of a second, then we'd see something rather different, like this. Instead of a very smooth profile and regular pattern, there we see many speckles grouped together into a size of image collectively about the same size as before, but certainly not smooth. 
and you can see in the graphical representation down at the bottom there, it's highly peaky, and there's a lot of information actually present there. In fact, it was only just realized, maybe 10 years ago, or just a little bit longer, that that speckle pattern held the actual image information that we would a bit be able to achieve without the presence of the atmosphere, which is, of course, doing the obscuring. But of course, you do need a large telescope for that kind of thing. Yes, the 200-inch uh, telescope has been frequently used. I've used this with Antoine Labrie, who is the man who invented speckling topometry. And uh, we, of course, sit inside the telescope. At the time, this was something like 10 years ago, uh, in the prime focus cage. Both of us were there uh, with the apparatus. And it's rather cramped, but nevertheless quite comfortable. And with that, you could obtain definite results. Yes, I've got some videotape here showing some speckles. These, uh, this is a picture which is a highly magnified picture of a star taken at the 200-inch telescope. The whole picture is the image of a star. It's in about, real time? In real time. It's about a second of arc across, is that, uh, which, is take, which, is, which shows that we're working under rather good conditions. And within that second, you can see uh, the speckles moving very rapidly, uh, dancing about, but little points within that entire image of the star. This, this, is, this is what you see with a big telescope with apparatus that allows you to see uh, in, in this short time that we require to, to avoid the smearing. And what do you get there with Betelgeuse? Well, if um, we look at a picture of Betelgeuse as we normally see it, uh, it's at uh, that... Uh, sh shown on the left here. That's a representation of an ordinary photograph. It's, it's, it's not a real photograph, it's a representation. Uh, that's about as big as it would appear. That represents something like a second of arc, a smooth profile. On the right of that picture, though, is the result of a speckle experiment which has extracted from that very uh, fast-moving pattern all the image information to produce what is the true image of Orion. So, in fact, there is an actual picture of Betelgeuse compiled by a computer from all the speckles that we've seen. But, Alec, what exactly is the theory behind it? Well, to understand this, let's look at a telescope um, represented here as a refractor. Of course, in practice, big telescopes are reflectors. But it's going to be easier to demonstrate this with a refractor. Yes. Uh, the light comes from a distant star and comes to a focus in, in the focal plane there. And the image is gen generally rather small and sharp. But let's remember that light consists of waves. And if we have two wave trains, as we see here, which are in step with the peaks of one, in step with the peaks of the other, and the valleys similarly, then the com combined effect of those two, when, when they are... Uh, put into the same place and in an image uh, is to produce an enhanced uh, waveform. In other words, they constructively interfere, as it's called. They, they produce a brighter spot. That's if they're in step. On the other hand, if they're not in step, then we can get to the state where a peak coincides with a valley and the result is to cancel each other out and then we get black as opposed to bright. And here we see both together with the waves both in step on the left and out of step on the right. Now, coming back to the telescope, how a telescope really works is to use, though, is, is uh, in its focal plane, those waves combine. Uh, we show here two extreme waves, trains of waves, from the outer parts of the lens in this case. And on the axis, those path lengths from the edge of the lens to the focus are the same on both sides. The peaks of one wave coincide with the peaks in the other wave train to produce the bright spot in the middle. And here we see uh, represented the center of an image, which is relatively bright, just peeking out at the bottom there. If we go a little away from the axis, then the path difference between the left and the right hand beam changes to the extent, eventually, that the peak of the one coincides with the valley of the other, and they cancel resulting in a dark region. We can go further still, away from the axis, 
once again the path length changes and we come to the point where the peaks again coincide and we get a bright spot again but it's not as bright as the center progressively you get rings or actually this is a symmetrical pattern where we're just seeing one section of it which uh, get fainter and fainter as you go further out now all this is true for a telescope of a relatively small aperture as we depict here if we look at a larger aperture telescope of course exactly the same thing happens on the axis the beams co coincide and the wave trains constructively interfere producing a bright spot in the middle and as we move away from this from the middle again they get out of step but because of the bigger baseline at the top there between the two extreme parts of the lens you more rapidly get out of step and the result is to produce a far more compact pattern than with a small telescope the pattern that you get is called the diffraction limited image that you can potentially achieve with that telescope now this picture here is the summary of this there's the small telescope on the left and the ring pattern now which is more clearly understood from that picture is rather big compared with the same thing for the big telescope on the right and those patterns represent the best that can be done with telescopes of that kind if they were perfect so in fact really the larger the telescope the smaller your star is going to look yes the telescope itself has a, a certain resolving power which depends on its aperture of course most telescopes haven't been figured to be as good as that and uh, they don't really produce an image quite that good but potentially they could but then of course you've got to reckon with the earth's atmosphere which is no help at all no what we really are seeing when we take a photograph of a, of a distant star is not its true size or the size that the telescope could potentially show us but the the fact we, we see that the, the the image has been smeared out what we see is the smeared image. It's as if we were looking at something at the bottom of a swimming pool that has been uh, distorted by the water. Yes. Now this is of course happening rather rapidly and by taking a relatively long snapshot, a long exposure, not a snapshot, uh, this is all smeared into a rather smooth looking picture. The telescope itself is, as I said before, capable of better, but we can't achieve this however big we make the telescope. It was thought that the image then was irretrievably smeared as a result. Here is a picture which indicates what is happening in the case of the atmosphere. But first, let's look at the left-hand side where there's no atmosphere. The star, which is quite a long way away, produces uh, parallel light. And if there were no atmospheres shown on the left, then by the time you get to the telescope, it's still parallel. And we finally get a focus that is relatively compact and of course if it were a perfect telescope that image would be uh, the diffraction limited uh, size that the telescope could produce on the other hand there is an atmosphere and that jumbles up the light and we see that on the right hand side and the result of that is to produce a much more splodgy image at the bottom there and this is clearly caused by the fact the light is coming in rather different directions by the time it's reached the telescope but the surprise is there's information in that large image which represents the true size of the image as if the atmosphere were not there. Here we see the telescope again with the jumble of arrows which represent the turbulent, the, the light having passed through the turbulent atmosphere. And there are three images that we show of very many more images that are actually present. But let's see how each of those occurs. Here's the first, the one on axis more or less. Out of that jumble of arrows, we can select some, all of which point in the same direction, as a group. And this group produces an image at the telescope focus, which is a perfect image if the telescope itself were perfect, just as we saw before for the case of a telescope without the atmosphere. This is just a selection of arrows, all of which are aligned. Now there's another set of arrows in that original jumble which also are aligned with each other but not with the first set. Again, these produce an image in the focal plane but displaced from the first image. 
And of course, there's another set. Here it is, which does the, exactly the same thing, but yet in another position in the focal plane. Now we see the three together with the jumble all together at the top, uh, producing, in this case, three images. Here is a complete speckle pattern showing many speckles in the focal plane. Each speckle looks about the same as the next. The overall group of speckles has rather an irregular shape. This is a snapshot taken at a rather short instant of time when the atmosphere can be regarded as being frozen. At another instant, we'd see a different speckle pattern in its overall structure, but each speckle nevertheless would be the same as before and as it's the same as its neighbor. And again, at another instant of time, the same thing applies. The overall pattern looks different because the atmosphere has behaved rather differently, but nevertheless, each speckle is the same as before. If we look at this in time sequence, then we see the sort of moving speckle pattern that we saw on the videotape earlier, taken on the 200-inch telescope. Now, it's important to stress that each of these images of speckles are essentially true images of the object as seen by the telescope. The problem is the image has been split up into a multiplicity of images which are moving around rather rapidly. And of course, a conventional picture taken over a period of time would smear that out into that uniform, smooth profile we saw at the very beginning. The trick is, in speckle interferometry, to select each of those individual speckles out of its time sequence and out of that overall pattern and combine them to produce a single image at the end. It's easy to see this when you see this multiple image of me. It's clear you can imagine that can be recombined into the image you saw before. Yes, because you're a great deal easier to combine into an image than the star is, and the star is a very long way away. So let's go back, shall we, to our constellation of Orion and those two brilliant stars, Rigel and Betelgeuse. And look first at the very distant supergiant Rigel, more than 900 light years away, and uh, that is a speckle picture of it. What does that tell you, Alex? Each of those speckles is about the best the telescope can do with Rigel, which is rather too far away to be seen as a disk at all, even with speckle interferometry. So let's come in now to Betelgeuse, which is a larger star, although not so luminous, and is considerably closer to us than Rigel. Now there's the speckle picture of Betelgeuse. This time you really can see something there that you can resolve into detail. Yes, you can clearly see the difference between this and the previous image. The various speckles are now much bigger, fuzzier. In fact, you are seeing there many images of Betelge Betelgeuse that in the end can be recombined into a single image as we saw at the very beginning. Yes, here we can see it again here, in fact. There is, there is this picture of Betelgeuse. We see light and dark areas on it, which would seem inconceivable only a few years ago. But let's go further out still. What about the, the galaxies? I'm thinking of the very active galaxies with very strange things in their centers. What about Messier 77 in Cetus, which uh, in that ordinary photograph doesn't look very spectacular, but is in fact very active indeed? Yes, this is one of a class of galaxies called Cephid galaxies. And the interesting thing is that the centers of these are exceedingly luminous, very, very much brighter than the center of our own galaxy. There's an activity there which is rather difficult to understand, but nevertheless, there are rather good theories to explain it. And in these theories, one expects there to be a very compact central core. It, it should not be just a collection of stars in a big cluster, but a much more compact central core like we see on this drawing. Uh, quite recently, there's been some measurements by groups in Manchester University and Imperial College in London, uh, which have taken speckled pictures of M77 and have shown indeed that there is a very compact center, which of course confirms the ideas behind these theories. Well, let's come now much nearer home and look at that curious planet Pluto. Not the outermost planet at the moment, it's closer in the Neptune, but it's certainly a very strange world, and now known to have a satellite called Charon. And uh, they can't be resolved by ordinary means, but here's an early speckle interferometry picture of it, actually taken at Mauna Kea. And you can see there half Pluto at the bottom of the picture, and there to the upper left you can see the bulge, which represents the satellite Charon. And that couldn't have been done without speckle interferometry. That's right. The separation is, is much too small to be normally seen. In fact, it's very difficult to understand from just the very fuzzy pictures you normally can get. Well, we have a better picture of that now. 
Yes, here is a very clearly separated picture. This was taken at the Danish telescope at La Silla in Chile. And there on the left is Charon, on the right is Pluto. Those, uh, that apparent ring is, is just an artifact of the processing. What this measurement has done, and other measurements indeed, to, is not just to show the existence and the true separation of the, the satellite of, of Pluto, but also what is the true size of Pluto which is very much smaller than originally thought or originally expected to be on the basis of dynamic arguments. Yes, I rather fear we must now dethrone Pluto from its planetary status. Anyway, spectral interferometry has wide applications, and Alec, thank you very much indeed. So these new techniques really are extraordinarily powerful. They would have been unheard of only a few decades ago, and they're making progress all the time. And I think it's rather amazing, you know, to reflect that by using these new techniques, we can now record details upon an object which looks so tiny as a star. Good night. Sky at Night is back on BBC One Scotland on the first Sunday in July. Good, sir.